ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Raymond Nikolas Podcast. My name is Gabriel Nikolic, and every month I bring you inspiring conversations about the future of education, science, and philanthropy. Top academics, scientists, Nobel Prize winners, and philanthropists. My guest today is Dr. Nina Milosavljevic. Nina is a molecular biologist by vocation. After completing her bachelor and master studies at the University of Belgrade, she has completed PhD with the highest honors at the University of Nice. During her studies in Belgrade, Nina was awarded the USAD scholarship to spend one year studying in the USA at Georgia State University. She also spent three months in Germany at the University of Göttingen for a dad funded summer internship at the end of her master studies. Since 2013, Nina works at the University of Manchester, where she held positions of postdoc research associate research fellow, and as of June this year, lecturer. If you're curious to learn more about Nina and her work, you need to listen to this episode. In just a moment, the one and only Dr. Nina Milosavljevic. Nina, welcome to the RT podcast. Uh, hi, thanks, thanks, Gabriela. Thank you. <laughs> well, that was a very impressive introduction. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for contributing to it uh, with a bit of additions, especially on the US and, and German part. Uh, I pretty much like the uh, the fact that you spent three months in the beautiful Göttingen, which is a great uh, student city and also popular uh, life science destination. Uh, but before we jump on to uh, some other parts of your uh, biography, let us start with basics. Where are you currently and what are you doing as we speak? Right, so I'm in Manchester in the UK where I live. And as you can see, I'm not in my office, I'm at home. <laughs> in our house, so you can see uh, some painting, paintings behind me. Um, I'm working from home today. Uh, so, uh, yeah, now I, I made a, a little break to uh, to speak to you. That's great. Um, let us turn to molecular biology, um, topic of, of your vocation. What prompted you actually to study molecular biology? It's not a topic that you come across every day. Yes, right. Uh, that's a very interesting question. So um, I think I was interested in biology ever since I can remember, um, even before I started primary school, which in Serbia we start when we are seven. Um, I was really interested how, you know, how our bodies work, how nature works. And I remember asking my parents to buy me a microscope. I mean, I don't know what I, but it was just a simple kind of toy microscope. I don't even know what I was looking, but uh, anyway, I thought I'm going to discover something <laughs> exciting. Um, but but then uh, when I actually started the uh, biology course in my primary school, uh, I had an amazing teacher. She she was absolutely amazing, uh, and she actually taught us uh, beyond the program. And I remember one of the first uh, lessons she taught us about viruses and DNA, and that was like almost thirty years ago. Um, and I found it really impressive how. You know, there is something called DNA that is a molecule that has this information, which then makes everything else pretty much like proteins, how we are made, how we are made and how, you know, how our bodies function. And ever since I knew I'm going to study that, I really want to understand, you know, micro mechanisms, how, how in our cells and then our bodies work. So that's how it all started. Uh, but I think I kind of knew I'm going to study microbiology very early on. Very interesting to see how early child developments actually prompted you to uh, study an interesting topic and, and were, were very scientific in the end of the day. Uh, but turning back to science, uh, why did you decide to embark on an academic career with molecular biology? You can also um, have a career in corporate uh, or in a, in a research lab. Uh, what prompted you to consider doing in after, after your um, bachelor and master studies a PhD in molecular biology? Um, I, I don't know, I always, I think, saw myself in the academia uh, just because, uh, you know, the kind of the way research is done, it's a bit different than than in, in, in corporate and industry. Um, it's more kind of, you know, you can do more basic studies, based understanding basic mechanisms, uh, which I think was really my drive uh, very early on. Um, and actually, it all started by, I, I knew I wanted to do a PhD after my master's. That was like a natural uh, course for me. But then after a PhD, then I knew I want to do a postdoc. Um, and then I got even more hooked up on like the idea of working in academia, working in, in this kind of like kind of really hardcore research environments, if, if you wish. Um, and then, yeah, and then it was, uh, that, that, that was my really kind of dream. And I'm really pleased that it came true um, recently that I've, 
I've, I've actually got a proper academic position here. Speaking about the research, you already told us that there is more flexibility in the academic world, but what were some of your early research endeavors that uh, hopefully you are following up to through this day? Well, I, I was um, <laughs> I was kind of interested, but as I said, like kind of microbiology in general was what I was very interested in. Um, but then when I, during my studies actually, I've got more kind of interested in neuroscience and understanding how our brain works. Um, and then when I was in the US uh, for my one year research, uh, it actually was the studies and research program. So I was, uh, I was privileged to work with Professor Paul Katz, who is a very famous in kind of invertebrate neuroscience. And uh, we worked on this sea slug uh, 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 where you can actually look at the neurons, like they are so thick that you can actually see them without a microscope. Um, and then I was really kind of interested in neuroscience and how, you know, how these neurons interact, what is, you know, how, how do we get from such a, I mean, they're not simple cells, but like for kind of cells, you have networks and then you have, you know, sensation, then you have processing and then, you know, what we talk, uh, like kind of you know, oral functions are led by that. So um, that, that was kind of what I was, how my, my, my journey basically started and how my interests were, um, were developed basically. But then, I, because I was I was very really passionate about microbiology, I wanted to do a PhD in microbiology and then later on move into systems neuroscience so that I can have this zoom in, zoom out perspective, if you wish, you know, kind of understand what is happening with certain cells, with the neurons uh, on a micro level, but then I can also understand the systems and how these cells interact and, you know, do processing of information. And actually the visual system is what I'm working for, uh, on for the, car for the last 10 years. And I find it really fascinating, you know, how just how we can perceive the world around us, like what we can see. And 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 um, so that's kind of the, the journey. But there were lots of kind of, you know, different projects and different different uh, uh, research interests that were kind of more specific along that, that that line. But that was the kind of the main direction. So to wrap up a uh, story on the on your research endeavors, so uh, the focus did not change. What changes like maybe some focus on sub projects from time to time, but the main focus is still there. Yes, yes. And I mean, currently what my kind of, with individual neuroscience, what I'm uh, really passionate about is, uh, one is kind of actually translational. So developing therapies to cure blindness. And I was actually funded by Fight for Sight, which is uh, one of the biggest uh, charities for, uh, for, for, for vision, for sight, you know, for vision restoration um, to, you know, to work on that kind of, you know, how we can restore visual responses in people who lose sight. Um, and then another aspect is kind of understanding visual system uh, in, in kind of healthy, part of, you know, healthy, uh, uh, healthy retinas, healthy uh, uh, visual system, but also understand how some of the non-visual functions are affected, like our circadian rhythm, you know, how, why do we sleep when we sleep, you know, while we are awake and how, how this kind of light um, impacts our, our physiology. Now, turning focus away from science, more on your life, what actually prompted you to change the nice Côte d'Azur for Manchester? Uh, bearing in mind, probably a lot of people will never even consider doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is, this is a question I, 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 I get. Uh, very often. So this is actually Nice. Well, that, that picture there and the other one as well is the, the old, um, old uh, town in Nice. Um, I mean, I lived kind of uh, a few places before I, I moved to Manchester, I lived in, in Germany, as I said, in Göttingen for, for three months and then in, in Atlanta in the US um, for a year. Um, I had a great time in Nice, absolutely. I had amazing supervisors. Uh, I had a very successful PhD. Uh, and obviously, I enjoy the sea and you know everything that Nice has has to offer. But um, combination of my private <laughs> circumstances, uh, meaning uh, my now husband lived in Manchester, and it was um, and also kind of the prospect of science was slightly more exciting in Manchester than in Nice. And what I wanted to do, particularly in terms of systems neuroscience, so that kind of made a decision to for me to move to Manchester. And believe it or not, <laughs> I really, I'm a big fan of Manchester. Um, and even when, you know, first I, I, I you know, I, I came to Manchester 
it was 14 years ago. And I absolutely loved it, even though obviously the weather was quite different than, you know, sunny knees. <laughs> um, but it was very kind of free, very uh, friendly city, um, very dynamic. There were lots of things happening constantly. And that's what I kind of loved, you know, having at uh, Nice is amazing, be more chilled, maybe. <laughs> so maybe I would, I would uh, you know, uh, regret my choices when I'm 60 <laughs> something or when I retire. But at the moment, that was the dynamic of the city was really what I loved. And then when I um, visited the, the lab that I was considering to move to and work in, I absolutely fell in love with this amazing group that's growing. And uh, I still work with people that I worked, you know, 10 years ago. And we have amazing, you know, friendships and amazing, exciting work, you know, happening. Um, and actually Manchester, our group is one of the biggest in the world for kind of vision and circadian biology. Definitely the biggest uh, group in, in Europe. And um, I think all these kind of factors, you know, contributed to, I don't know, me being happy about moving to Manchester. Um, but I do actually keep my connections with Nice, uh, and uh, we have some projects that we run together. So I have a privilege to, you know, visit there from time to time, which is very nice. Um, but yeah, I, I I love my my life in Manchester. And actually, I was I was offered a before I got lectureship in Manchester, I was offered a lectureship in Bristol, and Bristol maybe more similar to Nice, it's more kind of south, and it's very vibrant. And again, people are amazing, but I just couldn't leave Manchester. <laughs> That's uh, I know many people would disagree, but uh, yeah, love my life here. I made it so much uh, to the north uh, in England, so I cannot concur that. Uh, but there are definitely some vibes in some big English cities uh, that are quite vibrant compared to the rest of Europe. So I can definitely concur that position that uh, England maybe on the map looks like it's cold, but it's definitely more vibrant than some cities in Europe. Yeah, so, I mean, I completely agree. Couldn't agree more. Speaking about the future and uh, potential regrets about the Nice, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Right. So I'm not going to be 60 in 10 years, but... <laughs> But um, it's a very good question. Yeah, um, I mean, I I don't know yet. Haven't made plans. Um, I can see myself still in Manchester because I love it so much. But um, I because also I've traveled quite a bit, you know, around the world and live in different places. I can see myself and with my family moving somewhere else if you know opportunities and and um, something more exciting uh, comes up. But um, at the moment, I. It might sound boring, but I wouldn't be surprised if I'm still here in 10 years and, and really, you know, having the same, you know, having the same kind of life I do at the you moment. opened an interesting topic regarding the, I would say, uh, scientific Germanship. Is that something that happens from time to time that uh, actually lecturers tend to, or researchers tend to um, change their places of, of uh, work and life, let's put it that way, so because it's something that uh, for me, as a lay person, it seems impossible once you're in one lab and one university that you pretty much maybe have some, uh, let's say, guest lectureships, but in the end of the day that you not change uh, your, um, let's say, alma mater, to put it in that way. Yeah, uh, well, that's a very good question. I think you are absolutely right. It's um, once you are established, once you have your lab. So, for example, my position now where I do have my lab, where I have an academic position, to kind of move somewhere it would be a kind of step people do that um especially here in the uk and the us i think these kind of um uh, academic positions are maybe more fluid uh than in the you know the rest of kind of europe continental europe um but i it's still not as frequent if you see what i mean it happens people do it but not as often and it is a bit you know it it's not easy to do, right? Not only you gotta pack your suitcase, have to basically move all your equipment and and so on. Um, and another thing, kind of personally, because my husband is also working at the university, so he's a professor in electrical engineering um, here at the University of Manchester as well. So kind of finding two academic positions somewhere else and kind of arranging the whole move, um, I can see that it could be challenging. And as I said, I mean, it could happen if, you know, something way more exciting happens and uh, you know stars align or whatever <laughs> but i can't you know 
I wouldn't be surprised if it doesn't happen, if you see what I mean. I definitely see what you mean. And I also uh, like what I heard about uh, your vocation. But if I would ask you to choose one thing that you like most about your uh, current position, what would you say is that one thing? Oh, God, one thing, one thing only. Uh, oh, it's really, it's a tough one because there's so, I mean, I really love my job and it's really difficult to choose one thing. Maybe if I have, really have to, it will be like, there is, you know, it's, there are no day, no, there are no two days that are the same. Like every day is so much different. And it's just this kind of um, excitement about, and, 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 you know, you can't predict what's going to happen, basically, with your research, with your experiments. Um, it, I think that that, that that kind of, that part of excitement probably is what I like the most. And I I would imagine, I've never worked outside of academia, so I, I don't actually have my personal experience, but I could imagine them working in a more kind of standard job where you have an office work, where it's, that, that that's kind of maybe more um, predictable. Whereas what we do is absolutely not. And maybe that's what I, I, I like, I guess. Um, but if I can add a few more <laughs> things, <laughs> that would be really, I think the excitement about research, you know, when you, you do experiments, you don't know what's going to happen. And then if you find something that you know, nobody else ever found, uh, even if it's small, you know, because science usually doesn't happen that you uh, have a breakthrough every single day, but these kind of small steps get you to uh, maybe a bigger discovery or something that can actually impact, uh, you know, science and people uh, in general. Uh, but that's, that's, I think, what's really, really exciting and what kind of motivates you even when things don't go well, because that also very often happens, right? Sid, I definitely uh, would like to concur that unpredictability, obviously through this podcast, but also through my personal network, I had the opportunity to meet a lot of scientists. I think uh, every scientist definitely leverages that unpredictability in, in their work or in his or her work at a personal level because it's it's really exciting and you can really leverage on saying, okay, this is what I found out today, but the results tomorrow can be definitely different, especially if you're working in the lab setting or if you're going on to field, so conduct some field trials or clinical trials in case of life sciences. Uh, but I think yeah. what I would like to mention here, and maybe you will agree or disagree, I'd be interested in your opinion. What I think rest of the population can learn from scientists is definitely learning to value small wins. Because yeah. what you're working on is something that will take a lifetime or potentially a few lifetimes to actually conclude. And if you do not learn how to value small wins on a daily or weekly or monthly basis, then you will definitely uh, be lost in your work. Yeah, that's so, so true. I mean, I remember when I was a PhD student and um, I mean, I was just starting basically, you know, kind of doing my my independent research in a way. Again, I had a supervisor, but that was probably the first time I was kind of more uh, in charge of my research. And obviously there are ups and downs, more downs and ups, uh, as, as that's how science goes. But then I remember my supervisor told me once we got a really kind of exciting uh, discovery um he said you have to value and really kind of appreciate every single little win because 99 percent of time things won't work and that was so true um they're like these little wins we have in a day well probably like for you know in weeks <laughs> um really you kind of really have to value because otherwise it's so difficult you can lose motivation and i think that that's different in kind of in science and doing other uh in other jobs i think is that the time energy you commit doesn't necessarily uh correspond to the outcome you know to your success so you know you can spend hours days months years on something and it may not actually end up being what you think or you know doesn't work the way you hypothesize whatever because that's the that's the nature of our job you whenever you design an experiment uh, or want to do a study, you're doing something that nobody ever even attempted, right? So there is no, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. So um, it can happen that, you know, things don't work. So obviously with a good management now, you know, obviously with, with scientists who kind of are wisely planning their time, you identify whether something's not going to work earlier rather than later, right? <laughs> but you still can invest and, and lose time if you wish, you know, that's how we, we see things uh, 
and and so that's why really really it's important to appreciate and 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 celebrate every little wins. You have to be so resilient. Oh God, you have to be born resilient. That's definitely a word um, that we all have to learn. Uh, we had two years time during COVID pandemic or the heights of COVID pandemic, because uh, a lot of people will disagree that it's over. But we are now into another global pandemic, uh, lacking energy resources or at least a uh, uh, dialogue around getting them to the right places at the right time at the right amount. Uh, so speaking of that resiliency, uh, when I was preparing for this episode and the recording, I was thinking what I would like to ask you before we finish the call. Uh, and I actually find that it's quite interesting to ask someone who is a scientist to finish the following sentence. Science is important because... All right. Um... Well, science is is important because really it makes our lives better, right? So it makes us, you know, healthier. We don't need medicine uh, improving, you know, vaccines or therapy now for COVID. I mean, as, as mentioned, COVID, that's probably what we all witnessed, right? Um, and it's kind of more, you know, more recent um, or any other therapies for cancers, for, for basically anything, or like diagnosis, like that all kind of progress so much because of science, um, then makes our lives also in better in a way that we, it's more comfortable because now, you know, we have these, uh, this technology, you know, talking about outside life sciences, like maybe engineering and, you know, we have computers, we have all the, uh, you know, the internet, the phones, mobile phones and so on. You can, you can stay in touch with your uh, friends and family wherever you are in the world. I mean, we are doing now this podcast, right? So that's kind of probably um, due to science and technology development. So I think really it's, it's making, it's, the point of science is really to uh, improve our lives. And that's why it's important. And actually in Manchester now, we have, the University of Manchester, we have um, new uh, strategies that, we actually have to do science that's going to make impact in the world. So if I just want to, you know, study something or discover something for sake of my curiosity only, that's not good enough. It actually needs to be uh, applicable and, you know, have an impact. So to kind of improve people's lives. So I think that's where science is uh, here. And I hope that's what people think that we are, you know, scientists are, you know, working hard to, to, to basically improve our lives, not just to have fun and love, uh, as, as maybe <laughs> some people think. I mean, we do, obviously, and enjoy, enjoy our, 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 uh, our work, but I think essentially the point is why we are doing this is to make our lives better. I really like that answer. Um, I think one of the biggest counter-arguments I used in any, on any occasion that I encountered some of the vac vaccine skeptics, and uh, unfortunately I did encounter a lot of them during the past two years, but my biggest argument was counter argument was always when they said like you never know what will happen to you in ten years. It was like I'm afraid that in ten years time I will not be able to grasp the technological and scientific uh, advancement we are going to witness. That's my only scare uh, when it comes to you know uh, battling the any uh, news effects or any side effects of the of, of the COVID vaccine. So I think a lot of people are not aware how much our lives will change over the next decade. Uh, and every day actually changes a lot. So I think COVID pandemic was just a starter. And in 10 years time, when we look back, we'll be thinking how could we have lived without all these technological advancements? Yes, I mean, if you think about it, you know, the smartphones and so on, I mean, we, there, these technologies are only like, you know, a decade or so. I didn't have them for, for you know, when I was young, definitely. Um, and I still want to consider myself young. <laughs> We're not going to get there. But um, I think really it, it's impressive. And I mean, if you think about, you know, treatments for many cancers, many, you know, uh, many other illnesses, uh, it, it's really impressive how far we've been. And I think people take it for granted. Uh, and I'm not saying it's perfect. Obviously, it's not as you said. There are maybe some side effects and so on. But uh, honestly, if you look at the statistics and, you know, uh, it, it, I mean, we are, if nothing, we're not dying from, you know, diseases, illnesses we had decades ago. And uh, life expectancy is, I mean, I, I, we couldn't predict it's going to increase so much now. And who knows what's going to happen in another, as you said, 10 years or so. So um, I definitely think that, yeah, uh, I mean, people can see that or not, appreciate or not. But I think factor there that science is really improving our lives. 
that's a perfect note to end the podcast. But before I thank you for uh, taking part in this episode, I wanted to give you a chance to mention anything, any last words, anything that we might for, uh, forgot to, to mention in the beginning or somewhere throughout our conversation? Oh, um, I think we covered uh, lots of, uh, you know, a lot of different aspects. Uh, maybe something that I'm personally, as a, as a woman in science, um, uh, kind of, well, affected by and, and maybe passionate about is actually position of women in science. And, um, and while this is getting miles better, and especially in the UK, we have women in leading positions. For example, president of, of the University of Manchester is a woman, very successful one, and that's been for quite you know decades now. And we have even women in managing positions, like the, the deans and so on. Um, it's still, I don't think it's that great kind of worldwide. Um, and uh, actually, my grandma was the first woman dean at the other faculty of medicine in Belgrade. Um, and she was lucky twice, and that was in the 50s, 60s. But, um, but I think so things are moving and improving on that level, and some countries maybe more than the other, uh, but I think it's still not perfect. So I would just like to kind of maybe uh, tackle on that to kind of raise awareness that, you know, women are perfectly capable to do science and should be given chances and shouldn't be discriminated. And um, yeah, I hope that that's kind of, that's going to improve, uh, you know, worldwide. And also kind of from that perspective, help science to, to, to you know, to, to progress even more. Well, I agree with you and thank you for mentioning that. It's an interesting topic that we did not touch. Uh, I personally did not touch because I uh, believe in the equal chances for everyone. So for me, it's something that is definitely, that, that goes uh, all over the place. Uh, but it's quite interesting to see that you have encountered or you have witnessed situations where that is uh, not something that goes without saying. So thank you for mentioning that, especially for our listeners who uh, might be in the similar position or might have witnessed the similar uh, issues as you did. So thank you very much for that. And thank you very much for finding time in your busy schedule to talk with us and for being my guest on the r podcast. Uh, it was my pleasure and thanks a lot, Gabriela, for inviting me. And I hope... Uh... Yeah, that people will uh, find this interesting and maybe helpful for, uh, you know, <laughs> for their lives. <laughs>